Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, on behalf of the Center for Crisis Studies and Mitigation at the University of Manchester. My name is David Schultz, and I'm professor of synoptic meteorology and PI of the center. The purpose of our center is to bring together different researchers across the university who work on natural hazards and their impacts on society. So this is another one of our continuing seminars in our series for the past few months. I wanna thank Dr. Pan Suvanasang, formerly of our center for selecting the speakers, organizing and advertising. To stay informed of our activities, please remember to follow us on Twitter at UM Crisis Studies, or check out our website for event updates and video postings. The format of today's talk will be as follows. During the seminar, you can enter your questions in the chat box. If you're watching on the live stream, you can email your questions directly to me or um, enter them in the chat box there. We'll do our best to get, them all, get to them all during the question and answer session. For now, let me introduce our speaker, Professor Kathleen Sherman Morris. She's a professor in the Department of Geosciences at Mississippi State University. Her research focuses on communication of weather information, risk perception, human responses to weather hazards, and issues of diversity in geoscience education. She has a PhD in geography from Florida State University in 2006. She served as a secretary for the Southeastern Division of the Association of American Geographers, a counselor or board member for the National Weather Association, state coordinator for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, and she served as the chair for the American Meteorological Society's Board on Societal Impacts. The title of her talk today is called Tornado Warning, Communication, and Response, results from the Southeastern United States with an emphasis on individuals who are blind. Professor, take it away. All right, um, thank you for having me and thank you for accommodating my time zone. <laughs> um, all right, let me see if I can share my screen now. Pick the right one. All right, Does that work out okay? Looks great. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, so you just heard the title of my talk. Um, I thought, I didn't know who the audience was going to be, so I wanted to start out um, with a little bit more background information. Um, so first of all, uh, I wanted to just talk about where tornado risk exists. And um, you can see on the map, North America is um, one of the main locations for tornado risk. And my talk is going to focus um, on North America and specifically on the Southeast. Um, but you can see that there is tornado risk um, in other places in the world. It, there have been tornadoes on every continent um, except Antarctica, um, as far as I can tell. And um, so you can see that, you know, the UK is, has a tornado risk. And um, in fact, uh, one of the largest European outbreaks was in the UK in um, 1981, though there were no fatalities, according to uh, Dr. Greg Forbes. All right, so um, my talk is going to focus on the um, US Southeast. And um, I wanted to start with um, this image here on the right. And um, on my screen, my picture is blocking it a little bit. Hopefully that isn't the case for everyone. <laughs> um, but the image on the top shows um, where tornado, um, tornadoes are most common, um, all tornadoes. Um, but the image on the bottom shows where killer tornadoes are common. So when there are tornadoes, where are they most likely to be um, fatal? And you can see that the bullseye exists right over uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, so the Southeastern United States. And there are several reasons for this. Um, tornadoes in the Southeast tend to be nocturnal. Um, so this is a map showing the percentage of tornadoes that, are, that occur um, historically at night. Um, so you can see the Southeast has a high percentage of tornadoes that occur at night. 
Um, visibility is also an issue. So there are physical factors um, and social vulnerability is an issue, a big issue, um, in fact, for the Southeast. Um, so these things contribute to making tornadoes in the Southeast um, more fatal when they occur. So I have a couple pictures to illustrate some of these um, factors. So um, the picture here on the, um, on the left is an example of an EF4 tornado in Louisville, Mississippi. And I wanted to credit um, Alex Puckett as one of our former students who's now uh, working in Huntsville for taking this picture while he was storm chasing. Um, so you can see in this picture, there's trees, there's hills. The tornado itself is rain wrapped. So it, it's hard to see. There's dark clouds that are close to the ground. Um, and you can compare this to a tornado um, in the Great Plains in the United States. So the, the one on the right was taken by someone from NOAA, um, Brad Goddard, and this one's in Iowa. So you can definitely see the difference. Um, the ground is flat. You can clearly see that there's a tornado um, in contact with the ground. It doesn't look like just a thunderstorm. And then uh, vulnerability, social vulnerability is another factor. Um, things like poverty, um, presence of disabilities, um, minority presence, uh, uh, English as a second language. Um, so these are, oh, and housing. Um, these are some of the factors that contribute to the Southeast having high uh, social vulnerability. So the blue counties are ones that the CDC considers higher social vulnerability. And um, Mississippi, where I, I am from, or where I live, I guess, um, I'm actually from Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of our counties are in this uh, 75 0.75 and higher social vulnerability. So we have um, mobile homes. Um, we do have a large minority population. Um, poverty is, is a ever present issue in Mississippi, um, as well as parts of the Southeast. Um, so these factors contribute to our social vulnerability, to all hazards um, that affect the Southeast, but especially to tornadoes. And um, a study by Simmons and Sutter in 2011 looked at some of the key tornado vulnerabilities just across the United States. And um, the factors that they considered the, the, that led to the greatest um, vulnerability or that would lead to tornado fatalities were percentage of nighttime events, um, events that occurred in the fall or winter months. So if you look at, let's see this, um, this figure, over here in the upper right, um, you can see that there are um, higher than average tornado fatalities in the winter months at the beginning of the year, as well as at the end of the year. Um, so mobile homes also um, contribute to uh, tornado fatalities. And um, there are actually more fatalities that occur in permanent homes just because more people live in permanent homes. But um, you can see that um, overnight on this uh, map here, chart here on the lower right, um, there are a lot more um, fatalities per tornado in mobile homes at night um, than, than permanent homes. And then permanent homes have a little bit more during the day and then in the evening mobile homes have more fatalities um, as well. Um, fatalities per tornado. And the Southeast, they found that the Southeast was itself a factor in tornado vulnerabilities. Um, moving to some research that I did um, about, let's see, five, I guess a little bit longer now. Um, when 2013, um, I published a paper where I looked at 25 years worth of tornado studies. And um, it looked at other hazards as well, but this is a, just a chart showing tornado um, tornado statistics that I found from the different um, papers that I reviewed. And um, I looked at where people received their warning, um, were people aware of the warning, and then um, did they seek shelter? So of all of the papers that I studied, and you can see um, the number here of studies that it's reflected, um, about half received warnings from either siren or television um, about three quarters were aware of or received the warning and almost the same amount sought shelter. Um, now, I do think there's a little bit of bias in these numbers because um, these studies tend to be done after 
um, major events. Um, they are typically ones where tornadoes did occur as opposed to sometimes there's a warning that there isn't a tornado or a weak tornado that maybe someone doesn't need to take shelter in. Um, so they may be slightly biased that way. But um, you do see that most people were aware and most people did take shelter. Um, awareness and um, confirmation, these are some of the issues that, that I am in interested in in my research. And so I just put some pictures here um, to show some of the most common um, ways that people become alerted to tornadoes. Um, wireless emergency alerts on your, your cell phone, your smartphone, um, those are becoming the most common way that people receive warnings, especially at night. Um, some recent research by Ellis et al. Um, found that overnight, people are much are more likely to receive their warnings from their, their smartphones, um, the wireless alerts, um, than they are from other sources. But even in 2020, television is still um, a very common way that people both receive warnings and um, help confirm the warnings. And this guy here, if you're not familiar with him, he's um, he's one of our most famous uh, meteorologists on TV that uh, talk about uh, tornadoes, or he's, he's well known for his coverage of tornadoes. Um, his name is James Spann, and um, he allowed us to use some of his footage um, for a paper that a grad student and I published in 2016, where we looked at um, some of the things he was saying and um, whether he was on screen or off screen, what type of image he was showing. Um, this particular type of image shows reflectivity. There are other types of images that um, sometimes meteorologists show that um, I don't think people understand quite as well. There, people sometimes have trouble understanding this type of, it, of image as well, but there are other images that people um, understand less than um, this common image, which you would also see just on a normal rainy day, um, though not with so much red. <laughs> um, and then of course, sirens. Um, people do hear uh, warnings from sirens. Sirens don't offer much. They don't allow people to confirm anything. There are some sirens now that will um, actually speak to you and provide some additional information. Um, so those are probably more effective, but in, in past research that um, I did in, um, you know, after a tornado, people often complain about the sirens going off unnecessarily. And um, we also saw this in, in the study that I'm going to be talking about in a couple minutes. Um, sirens don't really allow you to confirm the warning. They just alert you to it, um, kind of like the, the smartphone warnings. And then you have to go to another source such as the television meteorologist to confirm the warning. And confirmation is very, common and it's a very important process or part of the process to um, convincing someone to take shelter. And then um, seeking shelter, most of the people in the, the papers that I reviewed did seek shelter. Um, I just threw some pictures up here to kind of illustrate. Um, most people take shelter just in their homes, but um, sometimes people's homes are not safe for them to, to take shelter in. Um, for example, if, if people live in um, a poorly anchored mobile home or um, an older mobile home um, or even a site built home that's not uh, structurally as sound as say some stronger brick or you know, masonry framed homes, um, there are public options in some communities. So this is an example, um, this picture up here taken by uh, forget if his name was Tom, but um, taken by someone that works for FEMA. This is an example of a community tornado shelter. Um, and I actually have a grad student right now who uh, part of his dissertation is looking at um, community, shelter, community tornado shelter use during COVID. So um, he has some, some interesting results that um, he will hopefully be publishing soon. Um, and then this is a kind of shelter that you can just have buried in your yard um, sometimes people have things, um, safe rooms installed inside their houses to make them safer. Um, so people do tend to take shelter. One thing that I wanted to mention that uh, as part of that confirmation process, sometimes time passes between when people hear the warning and when they take shelter. Um, 
they, they spend a lot of time, um, some people call it milling, where they're looking for information. Um, sometimes people go outside to see if they can see the tornado. So that is something where if you do live in the Great Plains, you know, maybe you can see the tornado coming from very far away and you don't have anything that would, um, you know, stand in its path. But if you're in the Southeast, you might have trees and hills and, and those kinds of things. So that's where um, visibility can really um, play a role in, in keep helping to keep people safe um, or preventing people from staying safe, I guess. Okay, so hopefully that's, uh, that's enough background. Um, so I'm going to talk about one project at length, but before I do that, um, I just wanted to, to briefly mention a project that uh, just began this past year, and um, we're a little bit delayed um, due, to, due to COVID, but um, this, uh, this is a project that I'm excited about and we're, we're just kind of getting it started. Um, so I'm working with um, Jason Sankvale at the University of Alabama, and I was hoping to be able to have some results to talk about today, but um, we're not quite there yet. Um, but we're looking at how people personalize their threat geospatially. So what kinds of places do they identify with? Um, how far away do they need a tornado to be or to, to perceive that tornado to be um, in order for them to take protective actions? So these are these are the research questions that, I'm, that we're going to be looking at. Um, does their personalized risk based, is it differ based on their personal characteristics? Um, what if their personalized risk area is different from an objective map based um, risk area? Does either have a dominant influence on risk perception? And um, it can be important because people do a lot of their own, um, you know, fact finding during the confirmation phase. They look at things like the radar on their smartphone or they look at where they're located in a tornado polygon. Um, so how are, they, how are they imagining this risk? Um, how are they perceiving this risk spatially? And, and does that risk feel to them like it's significant enough for them to take shelter? Um, so some of the things we'll be doing, and this is the last slide I have on this particular project, but we are about to start our, um, our survey. It's in pilot testing now. Um, and it will have some graphics. It will also get at some of those research questions about um, you know, the geospatial risk perception. Um, this is the part that was delayed. We, are, we were supposed to start with interviews and we were gonna actually have people, and we still will, but it, just, it, it, it will either be delayed until COVID is done or we're going to have to think about some new um, methods that we can employ that will keep people safe. Um, but we're going to have people draw sketch maps and illustrate um, their county. What do they know about it? What kind of places do they um, do they think about when they're listening to tornado warnings or watching tornado warnings? Um, and then we'll also show them an actual, um, a real map and have them do sort of similar things. And um, we'll, we'll analyze the results geospatially using a GIS um, to look for patterns and, um, and that sort of thing. So um, really excited to begin this study and um, hopefully we'll be able to get it kicked off uh, in just a week or two um, and I'll have results to present soon. Okay, so um, that said, this is the main um, project that I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time. Okay, so this is um, a project that has been going on for the last two years and um, it's a project that I'm also working on with Jason Sankbale and Darren Griffin, and it's improving accessibility and comprehension of tornado warnings in the Southeast for the deaf, blind, and deaf, blind. And um, both of these projects were funded by NOAA's Vortex Southeast program, um, which is, um, it looks at how can we better both predict the, the actual, you know, the physical threat for tornadoes, um, and then how can we better keep people safe? Um, how can we encourage um, people to take protective action, um, understand warnings? Uh, how can we reduce the number of people that are um, killed by tornadoes in the Southeast? Um, and for this project, I'm also working with the National Research and Training Center on Blindness and Low Vision, um, which is centered um, at Mississippi State. So um, they were instrumental in helping us get to this 
population. So my portion of the research um, at Mississippi State focused on people who are legally blind and living in um, Alabama or Mississippi. We did have one person from Louisiana and the University of Alabama, um, they focused on the deaf and deaf blind. So um, we did some things very similarly and then um, they did some things where they actually tested um, American Sign Language interpreters um, and translators um, to work with TV meteorologists. So um, I won't be talking about that part, but if people do have questions, I can try to answer questions about their part of the research as well. So we had two rounds of phone interviews, um, 25 in the first round and 27 in round two. And um, both of them were semi-structured. And so we had a list of questions and um, we allowed people to elaborate, especially in the first round where we were really just trying to understand things, um, explore things with the, the participants. In round two, we also included some quantitative measures. So um, that's more, uh, well, I'm going to be talking about um, the qualitative stuff from round one, but mostly just the quantitative part from round two. So for round one, um, some of our research questions were, how do people who are blind currently obtain tornado warning information? Um, what are their preferences regarding the warning process? How does it inform them if they're at risk and they need to take action? And um, what barriers currently exist regarding tornado warning communication and response? And um, I did wanna mention, since I didn't mention it on the last slide, that um, our population was people who were legally blind. So um, that's a specific definition that allows for some usable vision. So we did have some people that could see some and some people who had no usable vision um, with difference. Uh, some people could perceive light perception or could perceive that there was light. Some people didn't even have that. So um, we had a range of, um, of uh, people who were legally blind. So first we asked um, about their sources that they used and we found that this was very similar to the sighted population. Um, phone alerts and television down here were the most frequently mentioned sources used. Um, and then when we asked them for their preferred source, we also saw that, um, that television and, um, and phone alerts were the most preferred. Um, but you also see some things that maybe are a little bit more specific to this population. Um, the NFB Newsline would be an example of one of these that uh, multiple people um, mentioned. Uh, NFB is the National Federation for the Blind. And um, this is just sort of a, like a news source for them, but if there would be a warning, it would pop up um, to, to alert them but they would have to be on this web page or on this app or um, it wouldn't alert them like a smartphone, you know, makes a sound to alert them. Um, so things that are um, audio are tend to be more important um, for this population, um, I guess for obvious reasons. We asked how they know it was a real threat. threat. And um, a lot of people took that to mean, you know, what source again. So they gave a similar information, but um, a lot of people talked about specific message information um, that they received. Um, just like I mentioned with the, the past studies, environmental cues are, are, are important um, for people that, uh, people who could see somewhat, um, they, they still mention things like clouds or, um, the way the sky appeared. Um, there were also some things like a person's guide dog um, showing signs that there was something going on or things that they were listening for, like um, rain hitting the windows in a certain way, or um, one person mentioned patio furniture being moved. Um, so things that um, were sound cues that they also listened for. And you can see from the relative um, position on, on the graph here that environmental cues were not mentioned to a, a large extent. I think they are some of the more memorable things that people said um, during our interviews. 
And then um, the TV meteorologist was um, one of the common things. People also said that, um, well, they would be aware of the threat that was coming. And um, it seemed like for this population, um, several people knew that because they might be at higher risk, that they felt more responsibility to be aware ahead of time. Um, so that was an, another interesting thing. So looking specifically at message information, um, this is where some of the, the key themes from this project started to come out. So um, geographic information was mentioned over and over again um, in the interviews. Trajectory, um, I consider things that are both a place as well as um, like a, a vector, like it's moving uh, at a certain speed or a certain direction. Um, so again, it also includes um, an aspect of, of geographic description. Some of the other things included like how severe was it? Um, is there circulation? Um, was there a warning? Um, but these were less commonly mentioned items and then safety information like the meteorologist saying you need to take shelter now or um, things like that. Um, but geographic information, a very common thing. So um, we asked them what they liked and they disliked about um, warning information as it currently is. And um, we separated the, um, the, the text that we transcribed the interviews and separated that text into things that had to do with the source and the message and um, analyzed them. So these are some comments about the source. So some of the things that they either liked or didn't like, um, the message being too fast, um, the usefulness of the audio. Um, there were issues mentioned with the crawl or the closed captioning. The, the crawl is the thing that goes across the bottom of the TV screen. Um, and then the closed captioning, um, closed captioning tends to be bigger and bolder than some of the little things that you can see on a map. So it would be useful for someone with some usable vision. Um, but going back to too fast and the closed captioning, people mentioned that um, it was difficult because it went through fast. And then if they miss something, they have to wait for, you know, two or three minutes for it to go back and cycle through again. So this was also an issue they mentioned with NOAA weather radio. Um, convenience was an issue. Um, well, convenience was something that made people more likely to, to like a source. Um, and then smartphones were one of the things that were cited as being convenient. It's always on you, it makes an alert tone. Um, so it's, it's, it's good um, in that way. And then um, general oral quality had to do with things like it not being clear, um, text not being spoken uh, or put into words, just not being loud enough. Um, personalization um, would have to do with like the specific ability to, to um, like what specific information did it give? Like a siren would not really be a personalized source for a warning, but um, television or radar might be more personalized because you could actually like zoom into your location, listen for your location on the map or um, on in the uh, warning coverage. Some comments about the message really kind of echoed um, some of the things that they mentioned earlier as far as how much they know that it's a threat. And um, so again, we saw geographic description, um, description in general. Um, some of the things that the, the people we interviewed, um, they mentioned if they didn't like their current um, warning process, some of the things they mentioned were, well, the TV meteorologist says things like, you can see right here and the storm is moving this way and over there we have this. And um, if you can picture yourself not actually following along visually, um, some of that information is, is almost useless because unless they're actually saying, um, you know, look here at the intersection of Highway 50 and, um, and 182, uh, you can see that there's, uh, or we see that there's some circulation that might, you know, be a tornado. Things like that where just inserting some additional words um, make the warning information more accessible for this population. Um, and so again, trajectory, geographic description, 
precision also kind of gets that, um, that personalized geographic information. Um, I put a star next to understandable and radar because we asked people specifically about them. So I included them in the chart, but it doesn't necessarily mean that more people talked about radar um, voluntarily. We just asked people um, to talk about it specifically. Um, but we did ask them if radar was useful and it was useful for most people um, in the study. For people who um, had no usable vision, they even recognized that, well, I might not look at the radar myself, but it is useful because that's how meteorologists tell if, they're, um, if there's a threat. Um, we also asked them, are there any barriers for you in accessing information about tornado warning? And um, the first step for analyzing these response, responses was to group them in um, sort of the phase of, of the impact for them. So is it a barrier that um, prevents you from being aware of the warning? Is it a barrier that um, prevents you from access, access, assessing your own risk? Um, to confirm or, or say it's not a threat for you, um, or a barrier could be um, in the response phase. So you see that most of them do happen in that communication phase, but it could be partly because that's the way the question was worded. Looking at some specific barriers, um, you know, cannot see the information, that would be um, an example of something where it was probably um, either a confirmation barrier, like a barrier to prevent them from confirming the warning or assessing their own risk. Um, people mentioned specific things that I characterized as knowledge barriers, such as um, their geography, uh, like not knowing um, where other places were in relation to them. This can be a factor from, for somebody that just moves to a place, um, but it can also be a factor for people who don't have a lot of experience you know, with maps and with their um, looking at places around them. Um, then um, we did actually have um, six people, uh, six unique people say that they had no safe place to go. Um, I know one, one of these people lived alone in a mobile home. Um, so that would be a very clear illustration of some of the vulnerabilities that, that exist and how they can be magnified by, you know, having a disability and living in a place that's not safe um, makes that person even more um, vulnerable to the tornado hazard. Um, some of the information that they were interested in that they felt like they couldn't see, um, environmental cues, the radar, um, visuals. One person um, had a, a quote that was really interesting and he, he more or less felt like um, being blind prevented him from having the same sort of like agency in um, looking at the tornado warning information as people who had full use of their site, where if he heard a warning, he wasn't able to access the same information that his coworkers could. If they heard a warning, they would get out their phone and look at the radar. But because the radar was something he felt wasn't accessible to him, um, he didn't feel like he was capable of making his own judgment over whether it was safe. So he had to rely on other people. And, and you could tell from his discussion that that bothered him, that he really wished that there was a way that um, he could better use the radar information. So some conclusions from the first part, um, number one detail, but especially geographic detail was the most important. And um, one person likened it to Speaking like a radio sport, sportscaster, um, if you listen to a game on the radio, people have to be a lot more detailed with what they're saying than if you are just um, somebody showing highlights on the nightly news. Um, it tends to be a lot more vague and, and they also do these things like, oh, look at that kick or, you know, where <laughs> you're not actually describing the kick. It's hard to... Um, hard to imagine what, what it looks like, um, especially for people that, that cannot see. So we took some of this information from round one and we used it for our round two. So I'll finish just talking about this part of the project. So 
based on round one, does an increased level of geographic information improve the warning message effectiveness? So we, um, we played uh, participants what, what I'll call a fixed warning. Um, it was just a warning for the city of Birmingham, Alabama. And we changed it to have more or less detail. And then we also um, prepared for them a personalized warning uh, using their city um, to create a warning for them with more or less detail. So I'll show you an example of that. Um, that for the warning for Birmingham, we actually had somebody who was a professional read it so we could play it and it would sound like somebody who was a professional. Um, and then we also uh, used an experimental text-based probabilistic warning. And um, this is the type of tornado warning that NOAA is, um, is moving toward, um, being able to um, express tornado probabilities um, and then move those probabilities through time. So, you know, on this chart, here's the tornado probability now, and then this will evolve every so often. Um, so they hadn't, when we started this project, um, figured out how to translate this into text yet. So we were, um, we worked with them to, to translate it into text so we would have something for this population. And then we asked, how helpful is this warning? How bad do you think it is? And what would you do? So um, this is an example for the current warming, warning format. And um, I included the whole, an example of a whole warning um, for people that might not be familiar with what tornado warnings look like. Um, so this, they're told that there's, um, and this is an example of a personalized one that there is a severe thunderstorm capable of producing a tornado. They're told the impact. Um, this is something that was added to warnings a few years ago. And then locations impacted may include, and then we, they were actually read both of these in varied order where um, the lower detail might say rural central Dallas County, Selmont and Selma. Um, and the higher detail might say rural central Dallas County, Old Cahaba Archeological Park, Selmont, Selma, Craig Airfield, and Wallace Community College. So not just the cities, but also some places that people could relate to. So that's, that's what I'm talking about when I say the difference between higher and lower detail. So um, some of the results, um, so we have helpfulness results uh, followed by the severity results. And then the fixed one was just for Birmingham. Everybody got that one. Um, and then the personalized one, it was different for everybody. Um, so you can see that the one with more detail did lead to slightly higher um, ratings on a scale from one to 10. Um, so these are the means and the standard deviations. Um, these were not statistically significant. Um, the helpfulness of the personalized warning, um, this was significant at, at P is less than 0.1 which um, the P was 0 0.09, so um, not typically considered a significant result, but um, our population was only 27 people. So um, it may be a meaningful difference, um, despite having um, not a traditionally low enough um, significance. And then the severity, um, I will say the fixed warning, the, the difference in the severity between it and the personalized is attributed to the warning being more, um, it sounded more dangerous. Um, so we weren't actually comparing those two, but we were comparing less detail and more detail um, for uh, between those. And you can actually see that some of the more detail, the severity of the personalized warning actually went down, um, perhaps because people were listening for their, their own location, um, it's just the thought, we don't know for sure yet. Um, we'll probably be able to dig into some of their comments a little bit more later. Um, and then we asked them what they would do. And so these are the, the results for um, if we coded them as, as taking shelter. So um, the uh, warning with more detail for Birmingham did lead to um, a higher percentage saying they would take shelter. The personalized one, um, a higher percentage, but this wasn't significant. 
Um, so it's kind of a, a theme <laughs> for the, the results that um, they, there were differences, but they weren't significant differences. Um, and then this probabilistic text warning. So um, what we did is we took the, um, the example from uh, the National Severe Storms Lab, and I made this sort of template where um, there was an area I defined as 70% and an area I defined as a 50% probability. And so then I looked at this template over um, their particular location. And um, so this is an example of what the, what a probabilistic text warning might look at and look like. And this was reviewed by people at the NSSL um, and they provided feedback and we tweaked it a little bit. So um, this could be how a text-based probabilistic warning would, would look, but um, I don't think they, they really fully know yet. So there's a 70% chance of a tornado affecting the following locations and at least a 50% chance affecting these additional locations. So the people that we interviewed, these were set up so that they would be in this 50% additional location. Um, and then one thing I'll point out, um, tornado may form outside these areas, probabilities will be adjusted as the storm evolves. So people picked up on some of these um, things that are not commonly in um, a norm or a current warning format. So if we look at the last chart with the probabilistic ones added in, you can see that the, um, the helpfulness is very similar to um, especially the, the, the warnings with less detail and um, the severity is perceived as lower. Now people are in the 50% range, but um, the, the actual warning polygon um, of current warning does cover this same area. So it's not like we added, in, added area um, in these warnings, this would be um, included in a current warning. So um, they perceived less uh, severity and um, they were much less likely to say they would take shelter. Less than 30% said that they would in the probabilistic warning um, than in the personalized warnings, um, which were closer to 60%. So um, much less likely to take shelter upon hearing the warning, but what would they do? Um, they would pay attention. They would look for more information. They would call friends. Um, and it, so it had the lowest rate of taking shelter. But they did use this 50% this, um, you know, as sort of a get ready, heads up. Um, the warning um, may not be high for you right now, but maybe it will evolve into the future. Um, so some of the favorable things they had to say, there were lots of details, information, specific landmarks. These were not really different things about the probabilistic warning, but they were things that they liked, um, just like in the first part of the study. Um, they some people liked percentages and probabilities. Um, more people liked these than did not like them. Um, I guess they felt like they were getting more information, um, more useful information. And um, some people mentioned that they liked that uh, the warning actually said that future updates would be coming and they get prepared. Um, one of the things that uh, people said they didn't like about the current warning process um, was the lack of the, we sometimes call it the all clear, where you come out of your safe place or um, it's safe to go about your business again. Um, so people like to have that continuous, um, you know, refreshment of, of refreshing of uh, the warning information. Um, and then one person said that it, the probabilistic warning was more real, like the television broadcaster, um, and that it mentioned danger outside of the area, which the current warnings, um, it's considered either in the polygon or out um, without any sort of me mention of uh, being outside the range. Some things that were not favorable were the probabilities being hard to understand and um, one person talked about the probabilistic warning as being sketchy um, with too many ifs. And this is something that sometimes we hear about probabilistic weather information that like if somebody says it's a, you know, 60% chance of rain rather than it will rain or it won't, well, they're just hedging their bets or, you know, things like that. Um, but this was only one out of 27 responses that, that actually said that. So conclusions from this part, um, higher level of detail uh, seemed to be an advantage. 
um, though not always statistically, um, people did talk about the level of detail. Um, details were mentioned as what made it more helpful. People listen for specific locations. So um, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. One person said that with the lower detail, they had to pay more attention to where they thought the warning was rather than the one with specific locations, they could key in on a few specific places. So if people are only listening for more, um, for places that they recognize, rather than trying to understand how the warning um, plays out spatially, that could be a bad thing um, for putting too much detail in. Um, but I'm not gonna say that detail is a bad thing um, because most of our results said that um, people really want the detail and that it, it was helpful. Um, the extra locations were confusing to some people. Um, there's a certain level of, of information that someone can process cognitively. So if they're having to process too many information, too much information, um, it can be difficult um, for somebody, especially people who can't also confirm where these locations are um, visually. And then of course the, the probabilistic warning did not lead to shelter taking as much as the current warning style. Um, but people were listening, they would use it to wait for more information and broadcasters to, to get people to get ready to, to pay attention. Um, so one thing that um, I will point out uh, while I'm on this slide, the images on the right show uh, the top one is is a common um, a common type of uh, radar, and then um, the for for people that are normal uh, that have no color blindness issues, and then the two um, on the lower right side are for people with different types of color blindness. And there's actually a website that you can use to um, to see if um, how an image or how like a radar image or a map or something would look to people with different types of color blindness. So it's, it's cool to, to, to do that um, and to make sure your uh, graphics are accessible. Um, so I just wanted to end with acknowledging um, the sponsor, NOAA, um, through the Vortex Southeast program. And then um, I also appreciate our participants, the National Research Center on Training, um, National Research and Training Center on Blindness and Low Vision for recruiting the participants. And then my graduate students, Cole Vaughn and um, Taylor Pekacek for help conducting the interviews. So um, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions? People wanna put them in the chat box. Um, I'll start off with, with one. Um, how large are the deaf and, and blind populations in your part of the world? Um, Mississippi has a higher, a higher percentage of people who um, are legally blind. Um, I think in the United States, there's about three, three point something million. Um, as far as deafness, I am not positive, um, but some of these issues, um, that would be the population who would be considered legally blind. But these are also issues as people age, where people um, become hard of hearing, you know, some vision impairment. Um, so if you expand that to uh, people who are not just legally blind or legally deaf, um, it can encompass a whole lot more of the population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have a um, question from uh, Grady Dixon. How do you convert these findings into actions for professional meteorologists? Yeah, um, good question. So um, the detail is, is the one thing that has resonated the most with the, um, the broadcast meteorologists. Um, I used the, the same quote to talk like a radio sportscaster um, at last year's NWA and it got like tweeted and retweeted like so many times. Um, people really like that analogy. Um, so the level of detail, um, and this seems to be something that um, when people are starting out as broadcast meteorologists, they're not quite as familiar with their area. Um, like James Spann, the, the guy that I showed earlier, 
Um, he is just a proponent of getting to know your local community, your local area, you know, hanging out at all these local places. So he knows everything about his market. <laughs> um, but when you just start out, it's hard to get that level of familiarity. So, so trying to build that level of familiarity can help you better communicate the information. Um, as far as um, as far as NOAA, um, there is you know a little bit of information that they can take as far as the types of places in the warning. I think the the, the second study that that started will be a little bit more um, more useful because we're actually trying to get at what kinds of places people think about when they're personalizing their warnings. Um, and then the information from the probabilistic uh, warning. Um, I mean, we like we were the first to take their picture and put it into text. So I don't know if they were able to 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 use that to test the the the, the warning test test bed yet. But um, it at least, I guess, maybe helped them to get thinking about, you know, not just how am I going to translate this project that they call facets into, you know, television where you can see the the picture, but you know, how are we going to translate this into NOAA weather radio or a crawl or or things like that? So there's bits and pieces from different parts of the project that that will be useful to both NOAA and um, private sector uh, broadcast meteorologists. I think that raises an interesting question that, um, you know, I mean, I guess being earth scientists or meteorologists, you know, we're very familiar with maps. We're used to looking at maps, we love maps, you know, probably even as children, we were fascinated with geography. And, and for, for most people, I imagine that's not the case. And, and you kind of alluded to that and, and suggested, you know, this is where this next project is going, but I mean, do you have any sense of, you know, what fraction of people are just spatially aware of, you know, <laughs> where, you know, if you were to take a map of their state or the United States and just say, where are you, you know, how, how good are people at identifying yeah, where um, they're at? Some of the ge geographic literature suggests that people are pretty um, poor, <laughs> especially in the United States, I think, um, at locating um, states, uh, you know, other countries, um, things like that. Um, there have been uh, projects that have looked at um, like hurricane evacuation maps and people have had trouble locating themselves in, in their proper risk zone for that map. So I do expect that we will find um, some some issues and some of the local meteorologists, uh, the National Weather Service meteorologists have talked about this, that um, people um, people have problems with, with locating themselves. And um, actually uh, one thing that we've seen on Twitter too, uh, where a lot of times the, the interaction between um, the meteorologist on Twitter and the followers are, does that affect me? You know when they when they talk about a warning. Well, what about uh, you know my community? What about my neighborhood? What about my street? <laughs> so they're seeking that extra guidance and um, in helping you know that person helping them locate themselves. So I think it's a big issue. So we'll, um, hopefully we'll we'll have some some good solid results from um, the survey and the interviews that we're about to do. And um, you mentioned that obviously you weren't involved with the studies. With, with the deaf at, at Alabama, but, you know, could you speak broadly about, you know, the comparison between, you know, your results and any results that you're aware of from, from their work? Mm -hmm. um, some of the results were very similar as far as um, the ways they're getting warning information, um, some of the things they would do upon hearing the, the, the warning or uh, hearing the word, receiving the warning. Um, one of the main differences um, was the way that they liked to receive the warning um, with the use of the, the sign language interpreter being better than the, the closed captioning or the crawl. Um, so the crawl was an issue for both samples, the, the blind and um, the deaf, but um, where you know, people who are blind might prefer to have better accessibility with either converting that into, um, you know, things that can be read and, um, or at least slowing it down, making it more obvious for people that 
um, had some usable vision. People who were um, deaf um, really wanted the use of um, an interpreter alongside of the actual warning. So um, the, the folks at Alabama, they, um, they created this mock-up um, where they had a person uh, on TV doing the warning communication and then they had someone translating that warning to um, American Sign Language. And then they had someone else using that um, translation to um, actually deliver the information to the public. So it's, it's, it was a three-step process um, because some of the information, it sort of benefits from having that translation. Um, like if you can imagine like going from English to Spanish, there are some words that when they're translated literally, they might not make sense. Well, the same thing happens when you translate from you know English to American Sign Language. They had that translator to help it make sense to the people. Um, so they um, they actually brought some people in who could do that, and they found that it was very um, very challenging, very taxing for the the interpreters and the translators to take um, a warning and actually communicate it. Um, some of the warnings were a little bit simpler. Um, so we have different kinds of events and some of the events where, you know, there's just a few um, sort of, you know, EF1 tornadoes, those events were easier to interpret than um, they also had like an outbreak where there were, you know, several supercell tornadoes. And um, they found that a person could really only sign for about 15 minutes at a time before they needed a break. Like it was, it was very taxing for them. Um, I imagine so that they have to spell out the locations too. I mean, there's just not a simple yeah. spell for, for Birmingham or, you know, Choctaw or whatever. It, I mean, they have to, you know, spell out each character. And, yeah. you know, if you've got one of those expanded lists of, um, you know, that goes on for two or three lines, of locations that could be really tiring and and you'd end up really far behind where you know the the actual person who's speaking is saying you know what they're saying yeah um yeah that, that's a great point um yeah so it was just it was very challenging um they hope to be able to actually try this in a live event um where you know maybe it won't be like on the the tv channel that you're watching but like that they can have somebody and you know put it online somewhere um, to test it out in real time. So yeah, um, yeah it, it's it's exciting to to think about though. Yeah. Any any other questions in the Zoom chat room before we close up? Okay. So again, thank you thank you for coming. And uh, if you're interested in our uh, center's seminars, then um, please uh, check out our website and we'll see you um, in the future. Thanks again. Thank you, Kathleen, that was wonderful. Oh, thank Great. you. Let's see if I stop sharing. All right.